Boom. Welcome back to another episode of the Espresso Hour, where the running joke is this is going to be much shorter than an hour because we are once again hyped up on caffeine and coal. I don't know about you, man, but I've not been this excited to build in. I'm always excited to build, but like the energy I feel right now is is unmatched. I I feel the same way. I For whatever reason, I woke up this morning and I had this thought where I was aware that we're not going to be here forever. Like in this chapter, you know, like this chapter is a very specific amount of time and a year from now, two years from now, we are going to be in a totally different chapter. This is, this is, this is it. So soak it up, embrace it. Like this is only happening right now. And, and I don't know why that hit me this morning, but it made me, it was a really cool feeling. And that's why I'm glad we've done these style of episodes of just talking and documenting the journey, what's going on. Cause I know in a year we're going to look back on this and be like, Oh, look how naive we were or look how fun that was or something like that. So very glad we're doing this good initiative. All right, quick rundown of what we want to do today. I think let's start with some wins from ghostwriting so far. It's been cool to see some people already knocking down email course clients. And then let's jam on culture stuff because I know we've been talking about that for the last few days. Some thoughts as we build a $10 million culture, what that means from a foundation perspective. And then if we got time, I think we could do a quick brainstorm on a potential free group we're thinking about. How's that sound? Cool. So... Ghostwriting wins. Go for it. One of the most interesting things, just to keep people in the loop on this, has been, you know, we're only a week and a half into the intensive. And I think one conclusion we've already decided is, you know, we kicked this off as a four week intensive. And after this, I think expanding it and laying it out more so that it's an eight week uh, intensive, I think makes more sense. But it's been really cool to see that people who have embraced this writing, you know, five day educational email courses as ghostwriters, the like one of the very first things that we suggest is, okay, now go rewrite your bio and put that in your bio. And we've had multiple people who have done nothing but just put that in their bio. And they've had people reach out to them going, what's an educational email course, or I need an educational email course. And we've already had three or four or five people that have either landed new clients or upsold current clients. And we're not even into like the bulk of the curriculum yet. So that, that I think is one of the coolest signals is realizing that this offer has been hiding in plain sight for a long time. And now that we're really educating people on just niching down and doing this specific thing, like when you have people hitting you up just because you changed your bio, that's how you know that there's something here. And that validates the way we've laid out the curriculum too, because if they're getting warm, attention just based on a bio, wait until we teach the cold client acquisition, because that just means right when they come to their profile, it's like, oh, this is different. And that's kind of why we're starting with this almost profile funnel at the beginning, because once you have that set up, then all the efforts you spend on content, on cold outreach, on referrals, things like that are all sent to a working funnel in a sense. Yeah. And, and the thing that has really stood out to me in just these first you know two sessions that we've done, and at the beginning, a lot of our attention has been on the niche side of things, niching down on the service. So we're telling you, this is the service that you should provide. We're, you know, we tell people to niche down on the audience and the industry. And it was interesting doing that first session where you know we, we go through this in Chip 30, we go through this in the captain's table, but there's so much pushback around and people's hesitation of getting more and more specific. And I think what's funny, and everyone's going to experience it when we get into the cold outreach stuff, but when you do cold outreach for the first time and three people say yes in the same day, the level of like overwhelm that you feel, it like your whole life changes within a matter of hours. You know, you go from I'm living my life one way and then you, three people all at once all send you five grand. And now you have three different clients and three different expectations. And I think what's really funny is people always are so hesitant to get specific because they're like, I want all this opportunity. I want everyone. I want everyone. And then the moment two or three people all say yes in the same 24 hour period, they're like, I can't handle any more clients. It's like, (laughs) you didn't need a thousand clients in the first place. You just wait till you get two of them. And that's why having a service that you offer changes the way you think about audience building and attracting, you know, because when you're doing something like this, you're not trying to get a thousand, two thousand, five thousand people to say yes at the same time. You're going for three. And that is what unlocks that specificity. And 
So I think people who focus too much on like audience first, audience first, audience first versus providing something to that audience from the get go, get that uncomfortable niche down feeling. Cause it's like, oh, if I'm specific, I'm not gonna attract this huge audience. But the goal is not to attract a huge audience, it's a dense one. So it's cool to see that already happening. And once we get into the cold outreach, that's gonna be a lot of fun. Cause what, we're gonna have them send 50 messages in a day or something like that. What's your kind of take on that so far or idea for it? Yeah, cold outreach is literally like as much as you possibly can. And and what's cool about cold outreach is it's it's a lever that you end up having a lot of control over. Like you could open the cold outreach funnel for three days, get a client and then stop, you know, so you can push and pull that lever. Whereas warm, you know, warm lead attraction is it's just kind of always ongoing. It's there in the background. So it just depends. Like when I was doing my agency, we had a sales team. We had the cold outreach funnel going. We were booking five to 10 calls a day between me, my co-founder, our salesperson, two salespeople, you know, and there were months where we would close, you know, 10 plus clients in a month, have to go hire people. It, it just kind of, de- if you want to leave it open, you can. But yeah, I think our education for people is recognizing that like you have control over this lever. So you can choose how much you want to push and pull. Yeah. And that's ultimately the goal is to have some kind of lever that you have control over. That's not paid advertising. Cause that doesn't really work for a service like this, but that takes us into team culture. Some stuff we've been talking about that because I guess to set the foundation for why we're going to talk about this today, we've pretty much decided already that the ghostwriting Academy is going to become an evergreen, um, new cohorts, quote unquote cohorts starting every single Monday with a pre-recorded curriculum and then live coaching calls every single week with multiple days across the board. And what that means is we're now saying we're not gonna be able to fill, fulfill all those calls, do all those sales calls to bring in new students, so we're gonna have to build a team. And for context, like the current, everyone who's involved with Ship30 at all on the video content side, writing content side, student success, operations assistance, it's only 10. And we operate kind of in silos across the board where you know, our video and student success don't really communicate. So it's like a team of 10, but it's really like a team of three or four core. And then we kind of have little buckets, but that's going to have to change if we want to fulfill and operate the ghostwriting Academy at the scale that we think it can. And rather than hire too quickly or hire without some kind of longer term perspective on what that's going to turn into, we spent the last kind of week talking about what those exact roles are going to be. Do you, do you want to share what those roles are or where do you want to take it? Yeah. Why don't we start with that to operate this in a way where we're taking in 25 new students a week. That's the goal, right? If we can do that, I think we hit an eight figure business by the end of the year, which is relatively straightforward execution from here. Because what's interesting about running a a coaching program like this is you can reverse engineer the numbers and they're small. Like you're, you're talking countable units on a daily, weekly basis, and you can reverse engineer all that. And we think that to onboard 20 to 25 new students a week, we need a full-time customer success manager. And we already have that with Katie. We need two full-time sales reps that are enrollment advisors to take calls to help people make the decision of whether or not they wanna join. And then one extra fulfillment specialist who will be working with you. So we are not the ones doing all the calls during the week. We're gonna do one call on Friday and have one other person be kind of the coach for where the the student success manager sends them, sends the student to each call saying, hey, you need help with your bio, go to the Monday kind of social profile and social content call. You need help with cold outreach, go to the Wednesday cold outreach call. You need help with writing the email courses themselves, go to the Tuesday call. And that creates like this conveyor belt where at any time, Every student knows the next step they need to take, which call they need to attend. We know where each student lives. And then our Friday calls are like free form where you and I kind of do feedback. We figure out, hey, maybe it's a specific training we wanna do and that's it. Because the journey of every student is almost the exact same. We know that you don't need a lot of different custom things. It's almost like a conveyor belt. Yeah, the, the big unlock for me with this a couple of days ago was the bottleneck to scale with with something like this is always the subjective questions. It's like the situational sort of, this is my unique situation, what do you think about X? It's interesting to consider that while there, there are probably infinite combinations of subjective questions people can ask, if we just deliberately tackle those for a year 
And for each one of those questions, I write up something or I create a Loom video and I kind of assemble this like master Q&A vault. In the beginning, that's a huge lift and it's it's very taxing. But after a year, you've pretty much exhausted a lot of the questions that people ask. And now you have this repository that just takes care of everything over time. And once that really clicked for me, I, I started to realize how much building and educate like a coaching program so much of it is the efficiency of documentation. If you document things well, the people that you hire are like traffic conductors because they're basically just going, you have a question, I'm pointing you to this resource. You have a question, I'm pointing you to this resource. And I I never really understood the role that that played until like we started building this. Well, it's interesting to look back on things we could have started on Ship 30 early on. Like imagine that for ship 30 with all of the common questions. And honestly, we should just start doing that for this upcoming cohort, right? We see those questions, but with this, that's more hands-on than ship 30 is, it makes so much sense to have those pre-recorded answers saying, hey, we've heard this question a lot, let's go. And, and it's, it's interesting to think about, you should never answer a question more than two or three times because the questions are always gonna be the same. The students are always gonna have the same problems. And that's what's fun about bootstrapping a curriculum from the beginning. That first student is going to have a problem. We solve that. And then every student who joins later is basically getting to shortcut all the other problems that the original group didn't have, which is why you're able to raise the price on things as you go, because you are able to deliver those results more consistently. I think that's kind of the, like the virtuous flywheel of a coaching program like this. It's you're able to deliver better results as you go, which makes you charge more, which makes them more likely to put in the effort and that kind of compounds. You know, that was our biggest question. We were talking about it yesterday, which is like, where does this break? And I think it's such a simple thing, but it's, I think it's funny in hindsight, like how much I didn't understand it until we got into it and, and how, ma how many people I think don't understand it is where these things break is literally, do you do the thing that you say you can do? Our promise is, okay, we're going to help you land your first $5,000 educational email course client. If we deliver on that for everyone, it has unlimited scale. It doesn't break, Right. Where it breaks is we make that promise and then only one out of every 50 people unlock that outcome. And I think that's the most interesting thing about these digital education products, courses, coaching programs, all of it is you need both. Like I wanted, I wanted to mention this earlier is I was so surprised at how many people watched the crash course that we assembled in the beginning. I kind of made like a day zero that was just, here's a crash course on the ghostwriting landscape. Here's just a bunch of things that will help you realize like what you're stepping into. And I, I did not anticipate how many people watched that and went, this paid for the program itself. Because our whole philosophy is and has been so much, don't just deliver a bunch of interesting information, really strip it down and give people the actionable information. But what that really showed me is it's really both. Like you need a mechanism for here's all the interesting stuff and then you need a mechanism for and here's the tasks that you need to do. My, my thought on that is it's not as much information as the reason that paid for itself was the beliefs that it broke. Mm, great point. So it wasn't like you just gave them a bunch of information. It was, here's information that basically says either everything you've thought about this in the past is wrong, or you've never even considered what this actually is, like the actual benefits that could unlock from this. You're right, because a lot of a lot of the comments that people shared were, I, I had always heard numbers like this. You know, I'd always heard ghostwriters making 10K a month, but I never knew how it actually happened. Or I always thought there was a path to 50K, 100K a month, but I didn't know what it looked like, you know? And so you're right. A lot of that information was belief breaking. The, the validation and feedback from just the first two weeks is why our goal is to have this up and running by May with a full evergreen. Because it was like validated offer during our consultation calls and then boom, immediate validation on curriculum and boom, immediate validation on actual results being brought. So now it's like, okay, we've pretty much knocked down all three of those. What is the infrastructure that we need to lay to allow us to do that? And so I spent some time this weekend realizing that every hire we've made so far has kind of been, there wasn't like an outcome because we didn't really know what 
was being built. It was kind of like join the team or it was a contractor specifically for YouTube, specifically for something like that. And as we bring on both a new fulfillment rep, a new two new sales reps, it was like they might not be as familiar with what we're doing. One, because this is brand new. It's not ship 30. It's not something that maybe people have seen a lot. So we have to communicate what this thing actually is to those new reps. And as the team grows, having some kind of mission, vision, values that we, you know, we've had in the past, but I, we were sitting and talking yesterday and I was like, could you name our core values right now? And you were like, no. And I was like, yeah, me neither. And I wrote them, you know, and, and, and that, that clicked with me because as I'm preparing some of these hiring funnels, which we, we could talk about as a whole another thing is recognizing hiring as a funnel with a landing page, with an offer, with with a full, like we've been building that infrastructure behind the scenes to also allow us to hire. But part of that, I needed to go and define kind of the mission and values. So I sat, sat there and was like, okay, we have this. The original one with Ship30 was to help a million people start riding online. But I realized that that isn't our current mission anymore. And so started to see that evolving. We also had six core values, which is too many that we'll talk about kind of how we chose these three and bootstrapping those. But the very first thing was updating this entire document, which I kind of call the ethos document of what we're doing, Ship 30. And it has the purpose, the mission, and the values. So the purpose is why we exist. Right now it's enabling anyone to make a living writing online. That's updated from start writing online, which the, was the original Ship 30, because ghostwriting is not about starting to write online. It's to earn a living. And to eventually earn a living, you have to start. So you can see the evolution of that whole bigger picture vision versus just two years ago where it was nothing but an accountability Slack channel where it's like, who knows what this is going to be. I, I like that. Um, when you said that yesterday, that really clicked for me is kind of the evolution of that mission. And to be honest, it's something that, I mean, I know we feel, we both feel very strongly about it, but I, it, that's kind of been the hill that I've been dying on for 10 years, you know, is there's never been a better time in history to make a living as a writer. And Yes, we're niching down and we're talking about one very specific thing, which is ghostwriting. But the rate at which we're building and learning and integrating all of these things, I'm not going to be surprised if five years from now, we end up hitting on all of the verticals. And it's, here's all the different ways that you can earn a living as a writer. The, the biggest belief, like almost the missionary belief that I want to break in everyone's mind, and I think you're right, that's why that crash course has resonated so well with people, is the belief I want to break is that writers are broke. Like that's, it's just such a lie. Like in theory, especially with the evolution of AI and tech and now chat GPT, because everything is moving into language models, writers in theory are as valuable, if not more valuable than coders because everything's language and language is thinking. You could make the argument that actually being a writer slash being a clarified thinker is the most valuable career slash skill set you could possibly have. And so that's the belief, that's the missionary belief for us to break is people realizing that this is, this is an actual gold mine. This is not like Hemingway and how do I find a way to like, you know, earn a living and stare out the window with my chapeau and my cigarette, right? Like this is an actual gold mine and we have the tools and the resources to teach people how to do it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's cool to see that all evolve with what we've done. I see the purpose as like higher level and then the mission is measurable. So purpose, I wrote, we make it possible for anyone to earn a living writing online. That's what we're doing waking up every single day. And that feels really good because you can always point to that purpose of is this bringing us closer to that. The mission is provide education, accountability and community. So all three, which not, not just education, not just whatever. So provide education, accountability, and community to empower 1 million people to earn a living writing online. Because I know if we're, if we're doing a million people going through our programs, we're, we're in a good spot. Yeah. Let's walk through what the, uh, the values are, because I think there's some interesting things to touch on there. Cool. So for context, we had six values before this, and I've been down this rabbit hole right now that the human brain cannot remember or recall more than three things at a time. So when you have N objects, so N being the number of objects, the number of connections between those is N times N minus one in the numerator over two. So what that means is when you add an item to a list, 
sure the number of items goes up by one, but the number of connections between those items doubles and it rises exponentially. The way to, to drive this home is if you draw three circles and connect them all, there's only three connections. So three items and only three connections, meaning you can both like know where you are. If I was telling you to recap three things, you name the first one and then you know the second one. And then when you go the second one to the third one, you can think about where you are in relation because there's only three items and three connections. When you add four, sure there's only four items, but there's six connections. Do this for yourself, you'll see kind of how it works. But I, I was very intent on taking our core values down to three because otherwise you're not able to think about all three of them at the same time. You're like weighing this decision of which one of these am I following? I can't think about them all, I need to go write them out. So I spent some time and actually played with ChatGPT on this. I was like, here's our current six, how can I come up with three? And that I've found to be one of the best exercises with ChatGPT is to get it to distill your thinking and help you kind of be a mirror on that. I realized some of the values were almost aspirational in that like we put them on there like, oh, I hope we kind of live up to this in a sense. But instead I went the route of what are the things and behaviors and actions that we're currently reinforcing and rewarding, but we just haven't put words to it. And so for anyone building their core values, I don't think you can like the gobbledygook of honesty and truth as being core values, I, I don't think make a lot of sense in that. Maybe as you get into like a full blown higher level enterprise and you need wider casting core values, that probably is what happens. But when you have a small team, like you want extremely objective core values that people can disagree with and people can say, that's not for me very clearly that culture. So we settled on three, which was extreme ownership, relentless tempo and championship energy with a ship capitalized in championship for ship 30. So what I think that encapsulated was extreme ownership being the way we do things, relentless tempo being like the speed at which we do it, and then championship energy, which is just like the culture that we bring to do all of this. So I don't know where you wanna start with that. We can talk about the Slack emojis at the end, but. I was gonna say the, the, the Slack emoji thing because I think the way that you came up with that, I think was, was very smart. And it, it took a lot of the things that we were already doing naturally distilled them down. And, you know, I'm no math person, but when you explain kind of the quadratic nature of adding linear items, but exponential connections, that really clicked for me. And I was like, oh, no wonder you can't remember 10 values, you know? And the, the emoji thing, so what we did was each one of these core values, we then created an emoji in the Slack that we use. And each emoji is kind of tied to that core value. So extreme ownership is a brick, tempo is a Bentley, and championship energy is the Lakers 2000 ring because ship 30 started in the year 2000. And, or, or sorry, 2020, 2000. <laughs> and uh, the thing to that I want to connect here, because this is what we did with gamification in ship 30, is it's not emojis for emojis sake it's not badges for badges sake it's not gamification for gamification sake what it is is you're taking the core value or you're taking the the piece of education or the knowledge or whatever it is that you're you know you're standing behind and then you're tying an emoji or a badge to that action right so the brick is and and ownership is you're taking ownership over like these monotonous daily tasks that yeah, sometimes are kind of boring, but like we got to do what we got to do because we have an ultimate goal. If someone does that, brick emoji. We're reinforcing the link between those actions, you know, or hey, I just finished with this thing. And then two seconds later, Daniel's like, I've already prepped it. It's already loaded into ConvertKit. It's done, right? Tempo, Bentley, like we're reinforcing that action. Like, good, you didn't delay. You didn't say I'll do that tomorrow. You did it right now. Awesome. Reward that action, you know, or accomplishing some big project and us being like, we're one step closer. Championship ring, you know? And I think the tying of the action to the emoji is more important than most people realize. And I have, we've been doing, I mean, we had these, what? It hasn't even been 24 hours in the Slack. And I already see not just a difference in the inv the feeling of the environment, but I see a difference in like my brain where I want to do things faster because I see almost like the visual reward of the emoji tying to the behavior. 
Mm. And I felt I felt the exact same thing. I woke up this morning and was like, how am I going to go earn relentless tempo emojis in our Slack? And it's it makes it fun recognizing that now almost all of our communications have one of these three things in it. If it's like, okay, here's my game plan for the day. I'm spending this time doing this. Like I'm clear, I'm organized. Boom, brick emoji. It's like I'm showing up today. If it's, hey, this is done. Here's, I'm already thinking about the five next things. Boom, tempo emoji. And then like, I'll give some examples of how I used it yesterday. Like Jamie was booking a flight for me and she was like, you know, championship energy can have a lot of things, but one, just like a standard of excellence and just high performance and just general, like good vibes. And so I'm going to Houston for March Madness. And she's like, yeah, this, this one is like 260. It's only a hundred bucks to upgrade to first class. Uh, you deserve this and then drop the ring in there. And I was like, that is it. Like that's what we're, and we had been no more than, than like 20 minutes of since we started using that. But I was like, that's the type of thing we're trying to reward and already seeing it with how people are showing up with like their end of day and beginning of day. It's a super small thing, but anyone can do it. And so just on a tactical basis, these are all custom image emojis that I uploaded to Slack and then went and made our default one clicks to be those three emojis. So it's like, you're always kind of reacting with one of those. And it, it streamlines communication. Cause it's like, if I'm not doing things that are one of these values, like why am I communicating? How, right. What am I doing? How can I be moving faster, be bringing more energy or be just stacking bricks, getting things done. So I've enjoyed it a lot. What I'm going from here is like, okay, we have these three core values. What are like the three, again, no more than three kind of named and claimed behaviors that encapsulate those. And so I'll do that quick brain. Like I put them in our scorecard today of how does someone take extreme ownership? Like, what does that actually look like? And this is how you can have almost more than three because the brain can say, okay, I'll think about extreme ownership. Now I can think about three things within that. So I say things like having no room for ego, radical candor, and having a high say do ratio. This is from Cole Gordon, but I love that idea of a high say do ratio is I say things and I do them. If you can keep that at one, we know we're taking extreme ownership. So like giving language to that so we can talk about them in meetings, people can draw on them when they're doing it. That's like the next evolution of this. There's a story I, w- I wanna share because I think it's gonna be really helpful for, uh, for other people. So when we were talking about the uh, championship energy, and we've kind of just naturally done that from the beginning, but I think this was our way of really crystallizing and solidifying and like making the commitment to that, you know, like you and I talk about that all the time. We think of ourselves as professional athletes and that requires a certain level of training and excellence and recovery and preparation and, you know, and I really believe in that. I think that's really important. And, uh, one of the things we were talking about yesterday was, and I said, we should put this in our hiring documents because it's a very polarizing statement is we are not a family. We are a championship team. And the reason I think that's so important, a little side story I want to share. When I was building my agency, I definitely, and there's like some deep psychological stuff here we could get into in, in a future episode, but I really built a family and I treated it like a family. And what I've unpacked in therapy and all of these things is at that time, I was going through a really challenging time with my parents and my family. And so I feel like I kind of took that And because I didn't feel like I had a good connection with my real family, I went and tried to like build a different family for myself. And as a result, I made a lot of really clouded decisions because I was always making decisions out of like, what's the best interest of the person? And I want to, I want to ask them how they're doing. Every meeting started with 10 minutes of like, how are you feeling? Tell me about your life. Like I was I treated everyone as if they were a sibling or like a child of mine, you know? I will never forget, this was like one of the most painful lessons I had to learn as like a a first-time founder, was there was this girl, she was a writer, and she was like our third or fourth writer that we hired. And it was right at the inflection of like us starting to scale. And she was just not getting it. Like she was really having a hard time making clients happy we like were trying to hire younger people because they were, you know, you didn't have to pay them as much as someone who had like 10 years of experience. I was like, I can just train them. We kept this girl on for probably nine months, like should have fired her within 30 days. We kept her on for almost a full year. And I spent so much time doing extra Zooms with her, trainings with her, 
talking to her, giving her confidence, fluffing her ego. Like, like I just couldn't let go of this employee because I was like, you're a family, right? And then finally, we reached a breaking point where like, I literally didn't have any hours left. I had like put myself in the hospital with shingles. I was like, just my whole life had just completely crumbled. And I was like, I, I need to make the hard decision. I need to let her go. And I got on the Zoom with her. And I was like, you know, I'm really sorry, but this just isn't working. Like, I think it's time for us to part ways. And what she literally said to me was, I can't believe it took you this long. And I felt like, like my whole world in that moment, I just, I was so furious at myself because she literally would like, she like, like laughed at me. She was like, I can't believe you didn't have the balls to fire me like seven months ago. Like I've just been coasting. And I was so mad that I had like poured that much in. And that same thing, I learned that lesson like seven or eight other times. It was very, very painful. But I think that's important to share because a lot of times when people start projects, you hire your first person, you start your first company, you build your first whatever. There's such this feeling where people are like, we're building a family. We're all family here. We all take care of each other. And the brutal truth is like as the founder, as as the founders, as the owners, like net net at the end of the day, like most people don't care like that. Most people are, are like they really don't. And if you say you're a family, you attract people like that. Whereas if you say we're a championship team, this is the level of excellence that we expect, you attract people like that. And people show up and they understand that expectation. And uh so yeah, that was that was that's gonna go in the book of like one of those lessons I wish I didn't have to learn the hard way. Well, hopefully we don't have to do that with this team first mentality because it's it's worth thinking like what are the differences between a team and a family? I think teams are mission driven. They're trying to win a championship, whereas families are like there's default no mission and they maybe can go construct one. And so as I think about like you opening a call with 10 minutes of how's, how's life going, I think it's completely reversed. It's like, we're going for the mission and then you only ever dig into the potential other areas if there's a problem that's preventing achievement of the mission. It's like default, the rest is taken care of. You show up to the locker room and it's like, we're here to, we're here to ball versus come in and like kumbaya and things like that. And I mean, I was a former athlete. I know that where I operated the best was on those teams where it was like, we're here to go win a state championship or go win an Ivy League championship or something like that. And it was it was by no means kumbaya. And that's not going to be the case for everyone. Some people want to build a family-like business. At our current stage, we have seen that we want to operate it like a championship team. And it's just more fun, I think. It's like, you don't have as many opportunities to drop like Bentley emojis and ring emojis and, and all that as a family versus like, Hey, we're building towards something. And you know, the beyond certain, uh, I think it's both me. I don't know if it's a revenue level, but I think it's an employee headcount level. Like there's things that change, you know, once you get above 50, a hundred employees, once you get above 250 employees, like there's, there's actual legal things that change and like you have to, you know, make different decisions. But when you're this small, you're talking about 10 people, 20 people, even 30 people. And so the beauty of teams at that size is that we have the freedom to really pick and choose. Like, who are the 20 people we want on this team? And what are what do we value? And and what are we working toward? Whereas, yeah, when you when you have a enterprise company with 60,000 employees, <laughs> of course you're going to end up getting into our, you know, our values, our honesty and and trust and you know, compassion and we all, we treat each other like family. And like, that's for some people I learned that is not for me. And I don't think that's for you. No, definitely not me. I mean, at BlackRock, those values, I couldn't even tell you how many emails I got that said them that were auto archived just because they didn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything. So I guess where I was going with this from the beginning was now those core values in that mission are on all of our job application pages. There are going to be some people who are not on board with that style. And that's the whole goal is that you want to weed them out of the application process from the beginning. It's all about, I mean, it's the same as niching down. And this goes all the way, like I said, at the beginning of sales being a funnel. And so Daniel and I have been constructing this funnel of how can we templatize exactly what we're doing, creating a scorecard, the different interview steps, the response emails, so that we could then duplicate this across any new role we want to bring on if we wanted to scale faster. 
So this whole, you know, season that we're currently in, in this couple, I think like eight weeks before May is laying that foundation where we, we could, we're templatizing everything so that we could move faster if we wanted to. And then we'll get into what it actually looks like to ramp things up um, faster than we currently are, which I mean, we talked about this yesterday, but the number of things we're able to do in like a two week period uh, is still very high. It, not even still, just very high. Yeah, that's what's funny about these espresso hours is I feel like we've done and we're doing a good job of documenting it. But the reality is we we touch on like 5% or less in these things of what we do in a given week, you know, and the decisions that we make and the progress that we, you know, it's, and it's hard like that. But I love that. That tempo is, that's what we're doing. That It's relentless tempo. Like I, we don't have time to talk about everything. We're We're busy laying bricks. That's right. That's right. And soon enough, some more rings on the horizon. So that's all we got for today. I hope this was helpful. One thing I've been doing, I've been in a big consumption mode over the last couple of weeks. And if you're listening to this right now, chances are it's 35, 40 minutes. If you have a handful of takeaways, take two minutes, write up three of them and say, here's what I'm actually walking away with. Since I've been in that consumption mode, it's easy to listen to something and then just say that was great and then move on. But I think we shared some tactical things that you could take away. So take two minutes, write up three of those, Leave a comment with your three biggest takeaways. That way we know what stood out the most. Also, if you have any requests for things we could talk about, I think, Cole, next week we should talk about how we're going to transition our thinking into marketing ship 30 during this and how we're kind of weighing the you know, different levels of headspace that are required from running two separate operations like this and how that season ebbs and flows because I think people would be interested in that. So that's all we got for this espresso hour. Go ahead. I was just going to say next week is going to be an interesting one because next week we have the the next two modules for the ghostwriting. We have prepping all the the marketing for the upcoming Ship 30 cohort and next Friday we're doing a paid another paid uh workshop on headlines and hooks. And so that's basically like three different types of businesses, you know, you have high ticket, you have mid-tier ticket and then you have the low ticket all at the same time. And so I think we should be conscious of how we balance that. So then we can talk about it and explain, you know, here's how we segment those in our brains and execute all three of them. Yep. I think people would find that pretty valuable. So let's do it. We got our game plan for next week. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you're on YouTube, smash a like, smash subscribe, leave a comment so we know what to talk about in a future episode. If you're on Apple or Spotify, take one minute, subscribe, leave a five-star review. And most importantly, Shout, this, shout us out on Twitter, share it on Twitter, share it with a friend. That's how these grow. And uh, that's it. Enough caffeine for the day. And I'll see y'all next week for the next episode of the Espresso Hour. Have a good one, y'all.